At the start of the 2010s, the Need for Speed franchise was not in its best form. After the mediocre reception of Undercover, very dangerous, and the resulting identity crisis with games like Shift and Nitro, the franchise had to get itself back on track and return to being the racing game series which fans knew and loved. And this was achieved with the release of Need for Speed Hot Pursuit in 2010, developed by Criterion Games. Although it lacked customization beyond changing your car's color, the great gameplay more than made up for it as it was received very positively upon release, as well as selling more than 5 million copies worldwide. However, what if I told you that this was the second Need for Speed game released in that year? Because a few months prior to Hot Pursuit's release, another Need for Speed game would be developed by EA Black Box, the studio who had made some of the most beloved Need for Speed titles, like the Underground series and Most Wanted. This new game they were working on would become a free-to-play, massively multiplayer online game, or MMO for short. This game was part of EA's push into free-to-play PC games at the time, together with games like Battlefield Play for Free. And in July of 2010, their game would be released as Need for Speed World, a simple yet fitting title for a multiplayer game that combined the maps and general gameplay elements of Most Wanted and Carbon. Despite this push into the free-to-play market and reaching over 20 million downloads, the game had only lasted for 5 years, which ironically was much shorter than the aforementioned Undercover, which had its servers shut down a whopping 6 years after Worlds. So how did this large-scale multiplayer game end up having such a short lifespan? Let's take a look at Need for Speed World, its rise and downfall, and how its community allowed it to rise once more. Although not much is known about the game's early development, most of the pre-release footage comes from the initial playtests and beta versions, which were held between October 2009 and its official release. This was also a time when the game was initially known as Need for Speed World Online. And after a few months of beta testing, the game was released on July 27th in 2010, where players could start to explore a visually overall version of both Palmond and Rockport. As even though their layouts are practically identical to their original counterparts, there are some key differences. The biggest change is that both maps have seen an overall in textures, billboard signs and lighting, as the game now features an active day and night cycle. And to their credit, their revamp map, along with the game as a whole, looked pretty good at the time of its release. Additionally, the roads themselves have also seen some adjustments, like the complete redesign of the underground section in downtown Rockport, or the Rockport Turnpike, a large bridge at the southern part of the city which was supposed to lead to Tri-City Bay, the map of Need for Speed Undercover. The cities of Palmont and Rockport were connected with each other by using a few connector roads, which were first made at the northern half of the map. After this, there were two more roads planned to be added which would create a connection on the southern part of the map. And according to some teasers, even canyons were intended to be part of the game. However, all of these proposed additions to the world map have never been made, and the reason for the omission will be mentioned later. Another important part of any racing game is its car roster, and Need for Speed World certainly did not disappoint here. The game had over 150 cars at one point, which is still among the largest in the entire franchise. It also featured a wide variety of them, ranging from classic muscle cars and JDM legends, all the way up to supercars and hypercars. In terms of customization, the developers would gradually add more features to the game after its initial release. Although the customization was first limited to just changing the paint and applying some decals, it wasn't long until visual customization like body kits, window tints and neons would arrive to the game. Performance upgrades would also be included into the game, but with a new twist. Aside from the parts themselves having an effect on the car's performance categories, like top speed for the engine and transmission and handling for the tires, they would also come in four different colors, representing their specific bias. Green represents top speed, blue is for acceleration, red for handling, and yellow has an overall balance. This can therefore allow you to account for your car's shortcomings or even amplified strengths, like applying only green parts to increase your car's top speed. There are also multiple tiers of parts, ranging from 1 to 5 stars, with higher tiers being more expensive or, in the case of the top tier parts, could not be purchased directly and had to be obtained through… other methods, which I'll come back to later. There's one more avenue of customization I have to talk about though, but before I explain that, we'll have to take a look at what happens when you take your car to the streets. It probably won't come as a surprise to see that the handling is quite similar to earlier titles made by EA Blackbox, like Most Wanted and Carbon. 
The racing physics in Need for Speed World are something which I can easily describe as being easy to learn, but hard to master. Most of the cars in the game are very grippy, while still being able to have their own feel to it. For example, the high weight and power of a muscle car may cause it to feel floaty in the corners and requires more precise steering input, whereas a lightweight sports car will be very responsive and allows for some very sharp steering. Racing in a combined world of Palmet and Rockport is also not very different from their separated counterparts. Aside from the usual free roaming, that you can now obviously do with other players you may encounter, you have your basic racing events like circuit races and sprints, which can be done in both multiplayer and single player. Drag racing also made its return a few years after the game's release, with its system being lane styled just like its predecessors. There was even a free roam minigame called Treasure Hunt, in which you had to find gems scattered across a section of the map. However, the feature that most reviewers were the most excited about were, rather unsurprisingly, the pursuits. While you were initially able to start these during free roaming by simply smacking into the nearest police vehicle, they were eventually put into a separate event that you could start at any time. Probably because some drivers would start these pursuits by accident. The way in which these pursuits work is also nearly identical to the ones found in earlier games, with your heat level ranging from 1 to 5 and the police force becoming harder to overcome as your heat level increases. This game does come with one key difference though, they actually announce whenever there is a spike ship or rhino coming your way, which does take away some of the tension of the pursuits at higher heat levels, but also ensures you won't be surprised by a hidden spike ship behind the roadblock that you just went through. Despite being a multiplayer game, these police chases can only be done in single player, and the police will not come to interrupt your standard races as well. In order to accommodate for this, the developers have made up an entirely new game mode called Team Escape, a hot pursuit style mode where you have to race to the finish line within a certain amount of time while evading an armada of police cars. Overall, this game mode is pretty unique to the franchise and can be a lot of fun, even though they could become quite repetitive as there are only 8 of them in the game. Now at this point you may have noticed that there is no such thing as a nitrous bar in the background gameplay. This is because the nitrous is now over here. And this thing right here is the main unique feature of racing in Need for Speed World, the power-up system. In every game mode, you have 4 slots in which you can put a variety of power-ups, which then have a cooldown after they are being used. For example, you have the all-important nitrous that I just mentioned, which therefore works very similar to Pro Street with its single-shot style. But then there's also a power-up called Slingshot, which gives your car a general acceleration boost if you're in second place or lower, with the boost increasing in power depending on how low your position is. Every game mode has a specific set of power-ups, and since you can only take a maximum of 4 with you at once, you have to decide for yourself which power-ups you would like to bring to each event. So if you want to quench your first for Mario Kart while driving real cars, you actually don't need to play Blur or buy a Nintendo Switch. This game can probably do it just as well. And although some power-ups can be a nuisance at times, most of them either come with a counter or have some drawbacks of their own. These power-ups then nicely transition back into the car customization, because it allows me to explain yet another way to customize your vehicles, skill mods. Although the game initially had a skill point system similar to other MMOs, this was eventually changed into a system where you could essentially apply these skills onto a single car. Similar to the performance parts, they can give your cars a variety of boosts up to a certain amount, like increasing the power of your nitrous, decreasing the cooldown of a power-up, or even increasing the reward for completing events. However, most cars can only have up to 5 skill mods equipped at the same time. This therefore adds yet another layer of customizing your car, as you can either maximize the effect of one or two skill mods, or spread the benefits across a wider variety of them. I also have to mention the game's soundtrack, which is composed by someone you will probably not expect to have developed one for a Need for Speed game. Now, what if I told you that the person who made the song you're listening to right now, also made this? Yep, it's Mick Gordon, the guy who made the soundtrack for Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. 
and he has indeed produced most of World's soundtrack, from what you hear in the menus to the in-game racing music. Aside from his original soundtrack, the pursuit music in the game has been reused from Need for Speed Undercover, which is also definitely worth a listen. So now the question becomes, why did this game only last for 5 years, despite its great backbone, in-depth customization, heaps of content and a banger soundtrack? Well, I think you can probably guess the reason why. In the early 2010s, EA was already becoming very infamous for its bad practices, ranging from day one DLC to closing down a variety of studios like Maxis and Bioware which eventually caused them to be named as the worst company in America in both 2012 and 2013, becoming the only company to receive this quote-unquote award twice. And this side of EA was also visible in Need for Speed World, with the game being notorious for its pay-to-win practices. The vast majority of items in the game could only be obtained with Speed Boost, which was the game's premium currency. This includes cars, performance upgrades, skill mods, visual customization, and even the thing that brought them into so much controversy a few years later, loot boxes. Before the controversies of Battlefront 2 in 2017, EA had already implemented a variety of loot boxes into their free-to-play titles. In the case of Need for Speed World, not only were the item drops after a race completely random, there were also many loot boxes that you could buy with speed boost from ones that would give you out high tier parts, to loot boxes that would give you a random car, made even worse by the fact that some of the cars in the game were only obtainable through said loot boxes. And even if you did not want to buy those, some of the best cars in the game could easily cost over 50 euros. The pay to win problem was partially mitigated when they had transitioned from the very unbalanced tier system towards something that every Forza player must have seen before, car classes. Every car now has a rating, which could be improved using the same upgrade system as before. So now, you could upgrade your Nissan 240SX into a car class where it can compete with more powerful cars, like Skylines and Supras. Unfortunately though, this effect diminished over time, thanks to the addition of even more powerful cars later down the line, which usually featured absurd levels of nitrous power, something that the game actually does not really account for in the car's overall performance index. The push towards more monetization then caused a variety of problems for the rest of the game. First off, since Black Box had mainly worked on making more cars and not much else, all of the map expansions as mentioned previously had never been made. This also included the southern connector roads, so the only ways to drive from one map to the other were on the northern half of the map. Although the game did have some new additions in the years after its release, like the drag racing mode, an achievement system and improvements to the game's netcode, it eventually started to suffer from a lack of new content outside of just new cars. As mentioned before, there were only 8 team escapes throughout the game's entire lifespan, as well as only having a handful of events that cover both cities in a single race. The game would also suffer from a high amount of cheaters, which can be attributed to both a weak anti-cheat and the aforementioned pay to win mechanics of the game. The problems of Need for Speed World would then become even worse in 2013, when disaster struck for the game and its developers. In April of that year, Quick Climb Games, which was already a slimmed down version of EA Black Box, had shut down, effectively stopping any future development for Need for Speed World. After the studio's closure, it was only a matter of time until the game would run towards the end, and in April of 2015, the dreaded announcement was released to the public. The game's servers would be shut down in three months. Luckily, the team that was maintaining the game at the time still wanted to make it go out with a bang, which manifested itself into the end of the world event which provided a variety of community events, huge discounts, and pretty much everything in the game being available for free. But as glorious as this event was, it eventually had to come to an end. On the very last day, July 14th, 2015, the servers of Need for Speed World were shut down, along with both free-to-play Battlefield titles, putting an end to EA's push into the PC free-to-play game market at the time. And with the closure of Need for Speed World, it had also marked the true end of an era for Need for Speed games it was part of as at the end of 2015, we would see the release of the official title reboot. But we are not done with this video yet, and that is all thanks to this game's passionate community. 
A few weeks before the game would shut down, an offline patch was already available and would allow players to freely enjoy all the in-game content and race in single-player mode. Although I won't go into too many details about this, I will provide a few links in the description that will give a more in-depth explanation of how this has been accomplished. However, for a few years, we would still be unable to access the multiplayer features of the game. This all changed in 2017, when the Soapbox Race World project was announced, which would allow players to run their own servers for the game. Although it only first allowed players to drive with each other in free roam, we would see more of the online functionalities being restored over time. Nowadays, Soapbox Race World effectively has all of the functionalities of the original servers and provides a platform for a variety of servers run by the community, complete with their own economy, progression and even unique content, such as new cars, events and customization parts. From the large amount of extra cars on Free Roam Spark server to the more competitive experience like Knight Riders and World United, each server feels very unique to play on while still being based on the exact same base game. So it's safe to say that after the short and arguably sad lifespan of Need for Speed World, we've still managed to unlock the good ending where we could finally see this game's full potential. What do you think about this game? Did you play it on the official servers back in the day and do you have any fond memories of it? Or maybe you would like to know more about another Need for Speed game or something completely different? Let me know in the comments or on my Discord server. Also, most of the background footage you've seen comes from my Twitch channel. You can find links for this, as well as my Discord server, in the description. I will also make sure to put any links for Soapbox Race World and some of the servers that I play on in there as well, so you can have a look at this game for yourself. I will also make sure to include all of the music you've listened to while watching this video in there as well. I also have to mention that this video would have probably never been made if it wasn't for the incredible amount of support I've had on my Gran Turismo Challenge video. And if you like what you've just watched and would like to see even more in the future, Make sure to subscribe and like the video to potentially see more from me like this, or dislike if you didn't, of course. And with that, I would like to thank you for watching, and as always, have a great day. I did one, two flips.